Welcome to the latest edition of The Pulse with BP. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm your host, Billy Parvatam. I'm pleased to be joined now by Virginia Tech alum, current MLB Network producer, uh, Foul Ball Area podcast host, Matt Atkins. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Billy. It's good to be here. I've been following along with you, seeing some of the other guests you've had on, and I'm honored to be one of them. Yes, uh, and full disclosure, me and Matt go way back. I actually remember, I was thinking about this before we came on, we actually sat next to each other uh, in Buddy Howell's Intro to Calm uh, first semester experience with that huge class. So uh, we yeah, definitely go literally that. all the way back since uh, we started at Tech. Yeah, that, and then you were doing the, the news at WBT when I was doing the sports there. So, yeah, all the way back to freshman year. Yeah, that's right. And Matt, of course, uh, has uh, done a lot since he's uh, – well, not only in his time at Tech, but since he graduated from Tech, uh, like I mentioned, a uh, MLB Network producer. He's also the host of probably the most organized podcast I know in terms of, uh, you know, all the people I, we, we know in our circles, you know, foul ball area. It's close to 200 followers on Twitter. Uh, he's been doing it for quite a while. So, Matt, I guess my first question is what made you want to get involved in sports broadcasting? Uh, well, I always loved – sports I grew up playing baseball and I played a couple other sports here and there um, and then I think it was around 10th grade maybe ninth grade I tried out for the JV baseball team at my high school and I didn't make it and I was also wrestling at the time and I decided to focus on wrestling uh, instead of instead of playing baseball anymore but I still love baseball I love watching it and following along with it and so my thought process was pretty much, I'm not good enough to keep playing baseball. I got to find another way to stay around it. So that's how I got into to sports broadcasting. I wanted to be around baseball every day. So I figured if I tried to make my way as a broadcaster, that'd be the next best thing to playing. And like you mentioned, uh, while you were at Virginia Tech, uh, really both of us were sort of there before the sports media concentration uh, at Virginia Tech blew up. Um, and, you know, you were involved with WVT, did a host of other things. And, of course, now you're with the MLB Network. How did that all happen, you getting to be with, uh, of course, the number one baseball network, baseball all the time with uh, the MLB Network? Well, so I'm actually with MLB Network Radio, which is part of Sirius XM. So we're different from MLB Network TV. But uh, after graduation last year, I was living at home still, working for a, a local radio station here in Harrisonburg. And I was looking for other jobs, uh, other opportunities. And just in my job search, I came across Sirius XM. I actually knew someone who knew someone who worked there. So I talked to him, asked him what it's like, if it's a good job. He said, yeah, it's great. You know, usually you start out part time, but there's ways to work yourself up. And it's just a great, a great place to start. So I applied and it actually happened pretty quickly. Um, pretty soon after applying, they reached out, said they wanted to interview me. So I did a phone interview, which I actually found out after I started working. Most people do in-person interviews, so they must have really needed some help because I just did a phone interview and like two days later, they offered me the job. And so I, I took it, moved up to DC and I've been working there since October and it's been great, man. Uh, getting to be around people that talk baseball all the time, talking to players and coaches, interviewing them. It's, it's been a really great experience. Uh, for sure. I mean, like they say, connections, uh, who you know, can go a long way. So what, what's your sort of daily routine with your job with the MLB Network Radio? So it changes. Uh, I'm an associate producer. So usually there's a, um, a full-time producer there that is kind of running the show and I'm there to assist with whatever they need. So sometimes, most of the time, my duties are to run the board. So making sure the host's mics are turned on, playing the rejoins and the show open, uh, playing any interview or audio clips we have to play throughout the show, that kind of stuff. Uh, sometimes I'll get there and I'll put together the show open. If we have, you know, a funny clip from the previous day's show, pull that out, put it over a music bed and put the show open together. Uh, but sometimes they do put me in charge of putting the show, the whole show together. So on those days, I'll usually wake up and uh, I don't know, t it depends on what show it is and how much news there's going on. But sometime in the afternoon, I'll start looking at, you know, MLB.com, The Athletic, ESPN, trying to find the big stories of the day, put together a rundown of all the big topics, what to talk about, uh, try to find a guest to book a guest for one of the segments during the show. So on the days where I'm in charge of the show, it's uh, the majority of it is putting together the rundown and then that kind of stuff, getting ready for the show. 
like I mentioned, Matt is also the host of Foul Ball Area. Highly recommend you check that out on Twitter. They're close to 200 followers now. Um, so basically, to put it uh, in a simple way, very few people I trust more than Matt in terms of when he, uh, you know, brings his baseball opinions. He knows his baseball. And of course, let's let's go right to the big news uh, because uh, the MLB announced a few days ago they will return after really months of negotiations of really getting nowhere between the players union and the commissioner's office. Uh, Rob Manfred basically stepped in, used his executive power, said there will be a 60 game season. There's a lot of other details that go with that. But Matt, when you first heard the news, what was your immediate reaction? I was excited. I mean, I'm just glad to have baseball back and glad that we're going to have a season. This whole process of negotiations made it really seem like we weren't going to have any kind of season. I mean, there was so much back and forth where the league would offer one thing, the players counter with another offer, the league rejects that, then the players offer, the league counters, the players reject that. There was just so much back and forth. It was just like a big game of he said, she said, and no one really wanted to accept anything. So it made me really feel like there wasn't going to be a season. And then especially when Rob Manford came out on ESPN and said he's not confident that there would be a season when he has the power to implement the season. So that was, I mean, it was really disappointing uh, for a long time. And then earlier this week, when it started coming together, I was like, all right, this, this might happen. We might have a season. And then uh, I think it was Tuesday night when the, the players accepted um, the MLB health proposals and said they would report on July 1st to spring training. And that's when it was official. We, we have a Major League Baseball season set for 2020. And I was just really excited. It's only 60 games, so it's not, you know, that's way less than a regular season. But it's, it's something, and we're just going to have to take it. Yeah, kind of going off of that point, uh, I, re- I was one of the people saying, because I, I don't think anybody expected we were going to have a full 162-game season once this pandemic broke out. I was one of the people saying, I think to really make it feel like a legit season, you have to have 81 games at least half the season. Uh, but honestly, now my opinion is, look, we have a season. We already knew that given these circumstances, it's not going to be normal. Let's just be happy with what we're given. So what's your take on all that? Do you think whoever's the champion this season will be legitimate or do you think it doesn't matter? Everybody's got to be, everyone's in the same situation. So you have to make the most of it. I mean, what do you, what do you make in terms of what this will do to the legitimacy of this season? Yeah. I mean, I'm right there with you. I was hoping for an 81 game, 82 game season. I thought that would have been a a good compromise, but yeah, with 60 games, you know, I think the champion is going to be legitimate because everyone is playing the same amount of games. I don't think that's really going to affect anything. But stuff like, you know, who wins the batting average title in 60 games, it's a lot easier to have a higher batting average than throughout a whole 162 games. So I think that, you know, that might come, you might have to take that with a grain of salt when you look back in that in future or yeah, in future years, look back at 2020 and say, oh, you know, Joey Votto hit 400 in 2020. Well, it was only 60 games. So, I mean, it's impressive, but it's way less than a regular season. So I think for stuff like the, the stats, it's definitely going to have an impact. But uh, for, for the champion, I think you have to see them as legitimate. But it will have an effect. You know, take the Washington Nationals last year. They wouldn't have made the playoffs if it was a 60-game season. They were 19-31. and 31. They wouldn't have made the playoffs. So, yeah, I think that it's going to be different and it's going to be tough for some teams. You can't have a slow start. You can't afford it. Yeah, uh, being a Nats fan, you know, I, uh, Nats better get off to a better start this year if they want yeah. a chance to make the playoffs. Um, do you think a, one side ultimately lost in this whole situation? Because I guess just for me, and I'm sure a lot of other people are confused, well, if Manfred had the ability to basically force a season, why didn't he do it earlier for more games? Um, what's kind of your take on sort of that whole situation? Do you think the players ultimately lost? I mean, how do you – think going forward this might impact you know future CBA negotiations for example yeah I think the players lost because they wanted more than 60 games and when MLB gave them their 60 game proposal they countered with 70 games and the owners said that was too many I mean it was only 10 more games than the players or than the owners wanted so I don't know how that was that big of a deal I don't know how 70 was too many but 60 is fine so I think the players lost, you know, they're, they're getting their full prorated salaries, but at way less games than they wanted to play. So definitely when you look at the, the two sides and the negotiations and try to figure out who really won and who lost, the players definitely lost these negotiations because they wanted 81 games or they wanted even more than that. They wanted around 100 games, but they 
weren't able to get it. The owners weren't willing to go for that. So definitely the players come out on the wrong side of this. A couple of uh, rules that will be in place for this season. First of all, a DH will be in the National League for the first time ever. What's your take on that? And do you think that this will be a permanent thing going forward? I got to tell you, I'm not a fan. I'm a, I'm, I'm not exactly a baseball purist, but I'm close, and I don't like the designated hitter. I, I want the, pl- the pitchers to hit. You know, it's part of the game. If you're going to be a baseball player, you got to be well-rounded and be good at every part of the game. So even if you are a pitcher, you got to know how to hit the ball. And we're going to miss out on stuff like Madison Bumgarner. He was a great hitting pitcher. Even Max Scherzer, Steven Strasburg, they're both pretty good at hitting. Uh, Bartolo Colon, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't a good hitter, but he, hit, he had that home run. And so we're going to miss out on great stuff like that. And I'm not a fan of it. Um, I think it is going to be a permanent thing, though. I think it's something that the league has wanted to implement for a while. And this is just kind of the perfect opportunity to do it. And so I wouldn't be surprised if they try to make it a permanent thing going forward. Yeah, I'm not I wouldn't say I'm a purist on it, but I more just like it from a strategy standpoint and just the diversity. I mean, you go to a National League ballpark, you can see you know, the pitcher hit, you go to American League ballpark, you see the DA shit. I just think it sort of takes out that element of strategy. And like you mentioned, I mean, really for even the National League teams, I mean, if you've got a well-rounded bench, all of a sudden you have an advantage, you can put an extra bench guy there in the order. Yeah, exactly. I think the Braves, they're pretty uh, pretty well set for this season for having a DH because they've got some guys in the minors that they could bring up like Austin Riley, Adam Duvall, uh, some of their top prospects that are probably ready to come up this year so they're pretty well set to have a dh this year but some teams in the nl i mean they weren't expecting it and now all of a sudden they have this other spot in the lineup that they have to fill so that's going to be tough for them um i'm honestly i'm i'm interested to see what's going to happen because the roster freeze lifts this friday so or the transaction freeze so then teams will be able to sign someone there are still some free agents out there like yasiel puig somehow still a free agent and he could be a good dh if some team wants to bring him in so I'm interested to see if that happens. I think he definitely should get signed, but some National League teams are definitely at a disadvantage for not being prepared for having a DH. The other big rule that you know most people uh, were attracted to is the extra inning games. And now that uh, in this modified season, at least, all extra inning games will start with the runner on second base. Beginning in the 10th inning, of course, the rule will revert back to normal for the postseason. What's your thought on that? I know this rule has been experimented with at the minor leagues. Yeah, I'm definitely not a fan of this one either. Um, I was talking about this with my dad the other night. Like, how do you score this? If you go into extra innings, then all of a sudden there's just a guy on base. How do you put that in the score books? And then he scores. Does he get credited with a run? I mean, he didn't do anything to get on base. How does he end up getting home? It's, it's just really complicated. It's, um, you know, you, you, sh- you, do, you shouldn't just get someone on base. It's, that's not how the game works. You have to try to get on base and come home to score a run. So I'm really against this rule. Uh, You know, it might speed up the games a little bit, but I saw a tweet, I forget who it was, but they were talking about the statistics during a regular season on how many games go past the 10th inning and scaling that down to this season where each team's only playing 60 games. It might save like 25 games from going past the 10th inning. So it's really not going to make that big of a difference this year, and I'm really not a fan of it. Do you think there's you – because know, you mentioned speeding up the game. Do you think there's anything baseball can do to speed up the game? I mean, I know they've tried the mound visits and the shot clock, but, I mean, those have only worked to a certain point. Do you think there's anything that baseball can do, or are you of the mindset, look, this is the game. It's not as fast as football or basketball per se. We just have to live with the results. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly how I feel. This is the way baseball is played. You look at all the changes they've made, the pitch clock, the limiting mound visits, all that kind of stuff, and it shaves minutes off the game, just minutes. And so in the grand scheme of things, if you're going to watch a baseball game and it's three hours and five minutes long or three hours long, that's not a big difference. And that's not going to make a casual fan want to stick around and watch the game. So they're trying – to appeal to casual fans by shaving five minutes off of a game and they're alienating the real hardcore fans that are going to watch the game no matter how long it is and I'm one of those fans I don't care if it's a really long game or a short game I'm going to watch it 
So I like these, these changes don't really make that big of a difference and they're not having the effect that I think MLB wants them to, because I really don't see how a casual baseball fan is going to be able to tell the difference in five minutes. I agree with you. Uh, and really, uh, I think it kind of brings up the interesting point of how does baseball sort of continue to appeal to sort of younger fans? I mean, how, how do you think they, they have to sort of toe the line? Because obviously I think, it, you know, I pretty much agree with you. Like, look, baseball is baseball. I mean, it's not – you can't make it another sport just by, you know, trying to introduce some new maneuvers. You've got to kind of introduce it for what it is. So how does baseball, do you think, toe that line between sort of maybe following the more pure side of it, but also trying to bring in as much fans as possible. You know, Trey and I have talked about this on the foul ball area podcast, talking about marketing the players, because that's something that MLB doesn't do a very good job of. That's something that other sports leagues like the NFL and the NBA, they do a great job of marketing their players. And MLB could really do a better job of that. You know, they have all of these superstars, these young superstars. There's such a youth movement in baseball. You have guys like Francisco Lindor, Ronald Acuna Jr., Juan Soto, all these young players that are great athletes, great baseball players, and MLB is just not doing a very good job at marketing them, getting their names out there. We have Mike Trout right now, who is arguably the greatest best baseball player to ever play the game. And the amount of people, the amount of American citizens that know who Mike Trout is, is way less than it should be. I mean, his, his recognizability in the United States compared to an athlete like LeBron James, it's not even close. Yep. And that's sad because we have one of the greatest athletes in the world, possibly the greatest baseball player of all time. And almost no one outside of baseball knows who he is. So that is a huge problem. And I think that's what MLB needs to address. They need to make sure that they're getting these players out in front of the fans. I think they do a pretty good job on social media. You know, they, they've really improved that I think over the last few years, but they need to do things like, I don't know, getting Mike Trout more exposure on TV. The Angels are almost never on TV. Where you look at the NBA, LeBron James, whatever team he's on, they're always in prime time. So I think that would be a big thing. I think getting rid of blackouts would be huge because that just alienates all kinds of fans when they're not able to watch the games. So those two things, I think, would be huge steps forward for Major League Baseball. And I've always thought, Matt, the, the, maybe the most unique thing about baseball is that even the most hardcore fans, they might not necessarily follow other teams like they do in the NFL and the NBA. For example, even if you're a Redskin fan of the NFL, I mean, you probably have a fantasy football team. And, you know, there's, it, it, there's not as many games to where you can follow what's going on once a week with the other team. You know what's going on around the league um, pretty well. Whereas in baseball, you know, you, you've got your own team you're focused on for 162 games, you know, you're not as likely to, I, I think, keep up with sort of some of these other teams because, you know, you, you, your team's got a game every day, so you're really just focused on your team. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think that's true. And I think that, you know, when you look at baseball ratings, it has shown before that it's not very popular as a national sport, but regionally it is. The, the ratings for the regional sports networks and individual teams, they're pretty high in those regions. So I think it definitely is a sport where people focus on their team and they might not follow everyone in the league. I mean, it is tough to follow 30 teams for 162 games. So I definitely do follow the Braves way more than I follow any other team. You know, I'll look at the standings every now and then and look at the other divisions, but mostly I care about the National League East and what's going on there. I care about, you know, the what kind of stats Ronald Acuna and Freddie Freeman are putting up. So, yeah, I do agree with that. It's definitely one of the sports where you do follow your team and you don't really follow the league as a whole. I remember I worked with a guy who's from St. Louis and he told me uh, St. Louis is the only town in America where the NFL team would be the third team. You got the Cardinals, you got the Blues, and you got St. Louis. So definitely what you're saying, I mean, baseball really is most popular regionally. Uh, speaking about the players, how do you think this season will impact sort of, you know, the other stuff that comes with the game? I mean, the dugout, you know, I'm sure that's going to be modified to some extent. I know the MLB was saying you don't interact with players of the opposite team. You've got to stand six feet apart. I mean, this is really going to take away uh, from sort of the other stuff that comes with the game that we as fans love to see. Yeah, it's definitely going to be different. Um, I mean, not having fans at ballparks is going to be a big change in itself. And then anything else that comes with it, if the players have to stay six feet apart in the dugouts or, you know, I've heard talks of having players sit in the stands because there's not going to be any fans there. So that's definitely going to be interesting to watch. It's definitely going to change 
the small things about the game. You know, uh, there are rules against spitting sunflower seeds and tobacco. Uh, there are rules against high fives and handshakes and no fights, no bench clearing brawls. I mean, that's a huge part of the game, <laughs> even though it might not always be good. It results in injuries and suspensions and whatnot, but it's a big part of the game. So it's definitely going to be different. It's going to change the way they play the game. It's going to change the way that we perceive the game. You know, if you don't see players doing things that they usually do. How do you think this season is going to affect the pitchers? Uh, first of all, uh, relief pitchers, I mean, they might be used more than they're used to. I remember uh, Sean Doolittle last year for the Nationals, he ran out of gas and they basically had to sit him, send him to the DL for, for 15 days or so. So how do you think this season really impacts pitchers, especially when you talk about if you go to extra innings, you might not need to use them as, uh, as frequently if the game might end in the 10th inning. So how do you think this season impacts pitching and the strategy around that? Yeah, I mean, I – yeah, if you don't have as long games and the extra innings, that would definitely save your arms a little bit. Um, I don't know. See, this is where I think the the DH rule does uh, help and come into effect. I think it is to to save the pitchers because it is such a sprint this season with 60 games, so they can just focus on pitching instead of trying to hit also. So I do think that is why the DH rule is helpful this year, even though I don't like it. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be kind of tough on pitchers having this 60 game sprint and just having to go day after day in su such a short amount of time. And, you know, every game matters a lot more this year than it has in years past. So, you know, I think it could be a little harder on the pitchers. If you're in a tight spot, you really need to win a game and you have to use a certain pitcher. And going off of that, I mean, the MLB Institute of Rule this season where if you bring in a guy, you have to, he has to face a minimum of, I think, three batters. Um, you know, I think this takes away from sort of the lefty-lefty specialist or the righty-righty specialist. Um, I think for maybe the casual fan, it might be helpful in terms of, um, you know, there's not as many mound visits and not as many bullpen, bullpen changes. So what's your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, it does, it does take away from the, the strategy of the game. But, I mean – you have to think that players and coaches are going to find ways around this. You know, if a, if you want to bring someone in for a certain matchup and then they get that guy out and then you want to bring someone else in, but your pitcher that's on the mound has to face two more batters, maybe you go out there and the pitcher fakes an injury and you say, all right, you got to take him out. So I think there are definitely going to be ways that coaches and players get around this rule. And I don't know how effective it's going to be if they, if they can get around it that easily. Uh, speaking of, trying to look at sort of uh, the, the, the teams this season. Who, who are your, some of your favorites to, to make it to the postseason, potentially make a run at the World Series? I know it's 60 games, so really for any of these teams, I mean, we used to talk about post-All-Star break is the time where you, you have to have a good start because if you, if you start out slow after the All-Star break, that could really hinder your ability to make it to the postseason. But now it's really from the gate. I mean, if you have a five, six-game losing streak, that might – you know, do you win in this short season? So who, look, considering that, who are some of your teams out there you think these teams can contend for a World Series? Well, I got to go with the Braves. You know, I got to be a little biased, but I do think that they are built to succeed for years to come, not just this year with their young core that they have. So, I mean, I got to pick the Braves in the NL East. Um, honestly, the teams that have been dominating in the past couple of years, the Dodgers, the Yankees, they're definitely going to be the teams to be in their respective leagues. I think they'll definitely make the postseason and have a shot at making a run towards a World Series title, um, especially the Dodgers. They, you know, that they do have Mookie Betts, uh, even though they only have him for 60 games, they, they do get him for this season. Um, you know, the Twins had a good year last year, but the White Sox, they really loaded up in the AL Central this year. They got a lot of talent coming to Chicago, so I think they could be good this year. And I'd expect the Brewers to be good again in the NL Central, but I think the Cubs could also give them a run in that division. And the Cardinals, they had a great season last year as well. So honestly, the NL Central will be pretty tough with those three teams. But yeah, I think, you know, the Yankees, the Dodgers, I think they'll be pretty dominant. Um, and uh, yeah, I got to go with the Braves. Speaking of the Braves, I hate to bring it up, but I've got to ask you, I mean, what happened last season? I mean, you know, against the Cardinals, they were probably favored in that series. And then game five sort of, uh, laid an egg. As a Nationals fan, I'm not saying the Nats wouldn't have beaten the Braves, but I definitely think they would not have swept the Braves. It would have been uh, a six, seven game series, you know, and who knows, Braves win that series. Maybe there is a different world champion. I mean, 
what yeah. happened? What was your thoughts when, <laughs> when it all took place? Yeah, I think definitely a, a, a Nats Braves NLCS would have been great, but man, I mean, I was watching that series and I don't remember exactly how the first four games went, but I knew, I know that, you know, it was tied. It was tied 2-2 going into game five. And this was back in early October. So I was still, this was before I started working at Sirius. I was working at a, a radio station here in Harrisonburg and I was working that day and I was in the newsroom and one of our, uh, one of my coworkers was in the studio and the game had started. I think it started at five. So I was still at work and I'm like monitoring the game on social media, but then I have to do some work. And then my coworker like taps on the glass and he's like, Oh my gosh, you got to check this game out. So I look at it and I'm like, what is happening? The Cardinals <laughs> put up 10 runs in the first inning. I was like, what is going on here? I mean, the Braves were a good team. This should not be happening. And I just couldn't believe what I was watching. And I had to stay off social media for a little bit because everyone was giving the Braves a lot of grief about it. They were giving them a really hard time laying into them. I mean, people are savage on Twitter these days. And when you give up 10 runs in the first inning, they're gonna, you're going to hear about it. So it was, it was not a good day when the Braves lost that series. Yeah, they kind of uh, you know, had their worst possible game at the worst possible time. I tell you, though, it's not it's not the worst uh, playoff game against the Cardinals. They had uh, the uh, 2012 wild card game with the infield fly. Rule. Oh, yeah. That, I remember that. that was that was the worst thing I've ever seen in the postseason. Yeah. And uh, I'm speaking, I mean, being a Nats fan, too. I mean, I know they just won the World Series, but, you know, have had my share of uh, heartbreaking losses. So I can't really uh, say too much there. I, I know what it's like um, talking about the Astros. I know that the scandal has already been sort of. Um, discussed at length so I, I don't really want to focus on that but just in terms of the legitimacy of that championship do you think there should be an asterisk on you know the, the season my, my take is you know it, it's already in the court of public opinion you know I mean what are you going to do now give the championship to the Dodgers I mean I don't think that's going to happen I'd say it's in the court of public opinion you know those guys will will have it on, on them for the rest of their careers the rest of their lives that's just kind of my opinion what's your take on that yeah I think that's a good way to look at it I mean when MLB handed down its punishment and everyone was calling for them to uh, strip the title, that was never going to happen. MLB's never stripped a title from anyone. I mean, the White Sox still have their title from when they, or uh, the, I mean, I guess that's not really the same thing, but they didn't win. They, when they threw the World Series, that, you know, that series is still in the books as, um, I forget who they were playing that year. I think it was but, the Reds. Yeah, the Reds. The Reds still have that title. They still won, even though the White Sox threw the series. Uh, no title has ever been stripped by Major League Baseball. So that was never going to happen. And yeah, I mean, like you're exactly right. In the court of public opinion, everyone knows what the Astros did. Everyone knows what was going on that season. So they know that it wasn't exactly a fair season. So I think you got to, you know, you got to leave it in the record books as they won the title, but everyone knows. It's kind of like the steroids era. Like Barry Bonds has the records everyone knows he was on steroids but that's just the way it is you, you can't put an asterisk there because it, it happened that way but in the court of public opinion everyone knows what actually happened speaking of the astros they hired uh, dusty baker a guy i know well as, as a former nationals manager he's he will now be the astros manager do you think uh, what's what's your take on how that will sort of um, impact the astros i think he's a good hire for them uh, he's an old school kind of manager and i know that in today's game, he gets a lot of criticism for that and the way he handles, you know, his pitchers and his players and stuff like that. But I think with everything that happened there, I think they need someone like him to come in and kind of straighten things out and make them look good. And I think that he's the perfect guy for that job. And, you know, I think he wanted to get back into baseball after his last job with Nationals. So I think it's a good hire. I think he's a good fit for them and he should be able to straighten them out. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think uh, I was saying, you know, until Davey Martinez turned it around and, and helped the Nats win the World Series, I was saying Dusty Baker should have never been fired. He was the only Nats manager to win the division two straight years, whereas every other manager, Davey Johnson, Matt Williams, uh, Davey Martinez, they had missed the playoffs, um, you know, at some point during their tenure with a talented team. So I was definitely on the Dusty Baker bandwagon. So I'm happy he does have an opportunity to come back to baseball with a team that, you know, I know they cheated, but that aside, they do have the talent to uh, potentially make a run. So we'll see what happens 
with them. And then you go to Anaheim, you've got Joe Madden going back to the Angels. He was in the organization for many years. He's, of course, going to be with Mike Trout. Anthony Rendon left the Nats, signed a big contract there. What's your take on um, that hire, and uh, what do you expect from the Angels this season? I think Joe Madden is a great manager. I mean, he did great things in Tampa Bay, taking them to a World Series. He did great in Chicago, winning a World Series for them. I think that the expectations just got too high in Chicago, and they missed the playoffs one year and they let him go. I think that was a bad move on the Cubs part. He's a great manager and he should still have that job. Maybe he just, he and Theo Epstein were just button heads on things and rubbing each other the wrong way. I don't know exactly why they let him go, but I think he's a great manager and I think he's a good fit for Anaheim. I think that, you know, like you said, he was been part of the angels organization before in the past. So he knows the organization he's been there. He knows how to win clearly and now they've got a couple of good players there around Mike Trout. They have Shohei Otani and Anthony Rendon there in Los Angeles with Trout. So I think that all they really need is pitching. And I think that's what they should have gone after this offseason. But I think they are building up and they're getting towards the point where they can win. But they better do it soon because, I mean, Mike Trout is in the prime of his career. And if he doesn't get any more playoff appearances, that's really going to be sad. I agree with you. Madden should have never been fired. And, you know, it's kind of funny people talking about he should have been fired with the Cubs. I mean, he led them to a World Series for the first time in 108 years. And then they kind of, you know, mad they didn't make the playoffs. I think it kind of definitely puts things into perspective. What about Garrett Cole signing this, you know, what was it, $311 million contract? I give that he had a – give you that he had a great season last season. Now he's going to the Yankees, a team you mentioned should be among the favorites to potentially win it all this season. What was your take on that contract? Do you think it was a little bit overhyped? Do you think he deserved it? I mean, uh, what's your take? He's now in pinstripes uh, with the Yankees. Yeah, I think he deserved it. I mean, he had a great couple of seasons with the Astros. Um, I don't know what they're doing down there in Houston, but, you know, obviously the sign stealing probably helped their hitters, but their pitchers, man. I mean, Justin Verlander went there, had a career resurgence. Garrett Cole was good with the Pirates, but then he goes to Houston and he becomes the top pitcher in the league. So I don't know what they're doing down there in Houston with their pitchers, but it's working. And Garrett Cole, I think he's a great he's a great pickup for any team that got him. So the the Yankees should be really happy with him. I'm not surprised he went there because he's he, you know he grew up a Yankees fan. He had that sign that he took to a Yankees game when he was a kid. He had that sign there with him when he uh, when they had the press conference to introduce him with the Yankees. So I'm not at all surprised that he ended up going to New York. And I think it just really bolsters the team that they already have. Uh, speaking of kind of going off the, uh, off the field now, but talking about uh, – I, I know you probably saw it the recent 30 for 30 long gone summer with Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa um, talking about really a, a, a scenario that helped baseball get its fans back after the 94 strike. What was your take on the documentary? Because this is something I really want to discuss with you because – you know, I was looking forward to this documentary. I don't know about you, but I, I thought it was, I was kind of, it was kind of disappointing just because I felt like it was uh, a little bit too one-sided in favor of Maguire. Now, maybe that might be because he ultimately broke the record, finished ahead of Sosa, so maybe the victors uh, write the spoils, so to speak. But um, I, I just felt like it was a great story that um, production-wise was not done in the best way. What was your thought on the documentary? Yeah, uh, I would agree with that. I was really looking forward to it because – over the past couple of weeks leading up to it, there was the whole Last Dance documentary on ESPN. And I'm not a basketball fan, really, so I didn't watch that. But just seeing people talk about it on social media, I was like, man, I feel like I'm missing out. Like, I want, I want a baseball version of this. So I was really excited when we got a baseball documentary and about one of the, the biggest seasons in Major League Baseball history. But it was definitely really one-sided. It was almost all from Mark McGuire's perspective. And you're right, he did. He was the first one to break Roger Maris's record, but Sammy Sosa went on to break that record also. He went on to hit more than 61 home runs that season. He ended up winning the MVP that season. So they really should have focused on Sammy Sosa a little more. And I'm really, I, I was really disappointed in that part of it. Uh, I've read some other criticisms of it. Um, the, the production, like you said, was not very good. They used a lot of shots of Wrigley Field from present day Wrigley <laughs> Field when the, the documentary is set in 1998. Like, that's what they're talking about. But they used shots of fans 
and the crowd at Wrigley Field from 2019. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. There has to be archival footage of Wrigley Field in 1998 that they could have used. So I don't know what was going on there. Uh, I mean, the yeah, those, those are my two main criticisms of it. But I also, I don't know what your feelings are on the steroids era and whether or not those guys should be in the Hall of Fame. I personally don't think that they should. You know, I think what they did was wrong and they knew what they were doing. And I think that, you know, you do have to respect them as a player, but you don't have to glorify or enshrine them in the Hall of Fame. And I think that this documentary kind of tried to paint them in a better light. It kind of tried to make them seem like, like they didn't know that what they were doing was wrong. I mean, Mark McGuire said that he was only taking steroids for injuries and that if he knew everything that would happen, he wouldn't do it and he wouldn't encourage anyone else to do it. So I think the documentary tried to paint them in a better light and was kind of like trying to make them look good and help them maybe make an, a, a Hall of Fame case for themselves. And I didn't really like that part because I don't like, you know, I'm, I'm against steroids in baseball, even though the 1998 season was great for the popularity of the game. The steroids era ultimately hurt baseball when all the scandal happened and when everything came out. So I think it tried to make them look good and, uh, and kind of repaint the picture of themselves. Yeah, I agree with you in principle that I don't think we should give the same recognition to, you know, people who have used steroids as opposed to people who didn't. I guess my question, and this is a genuine question I wanted to get your take is, how do you sort of draw the line? Because I think there's some guys that, you know, suspected that they took steroids, but it was never quote unquote proven. I think that might've been the case with Sammy Sosa. I mean, at least that's how they portrayed in the documentary. Um, you know, Barry Bonds is another guy, some of these other guys, Jose Canseco, Rafael Palmero. I mean, how do you sort of draw that line? Because, you know, there's some guys who were quote unquote suspected users, but it was never really proven. So uh, I, I've heard sort of the argument, well, if you don't know, just let everybody in because, you know, you can't really go through every case. I guess that's the argument some people have, uh, have made you can't go through every individual case but what's your take on sort of how do we sort of uh, solve that yeah it is very tough especially because towards the you know the beginning of the steroids era and the steroid scandal it wasn't really against the rules to use steroids uh so you know like there was no written rule in major league baseball that they couldn't use steroids so it is tough to say like oh this guy used it when it was against the rules keep him out but this guy used it when it wasn't against the rules so he's fine Plus, there, there wasn't a whole lot of testing back then. So it, it is really tough to know who exactly was using and who wasn't. So, yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's tough to draw the line. But guys like Mark McGuire, he's admitted to it. Sammy Sosa hasn't admitted to it. He never got caught. But you're right. He is highly suspected of using steroids, as is Barry Bonds. I don't think he ever tested positive. I don't think he's ever admitted to it. But everyone just knows that he used them. So it is, it is a really tough line to draw. And like I said, you do I, like you have to respect them as a player because even without the steroids, they were good players. You know, it, the the steroids can give you more power, but you still have to make contact with the ball. And I don't know. And they 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 did a lot of good things for the game. Like the 1998 season, baseball was still hurting from the strike in '94, and that home run chase between Sosa and McGuire it helped grow the game popularity wise. So they did do good things for the game. But like I said, they did hurt the game when the scandal came out, when the news broke about steroids users in the league. So it is really tough to draw the line. And I, I don't know. I mean, to sum it up, answer your question, I really don't know where to draw the line because do you just say that everyone who was using before it was a written rule is allowed in and everyone who gets caught after it was a written rule, you don't allow them in? I don't know. I always think this is an interesting question because, you know, we just had the uh, documentary about the 98 home run chase. If, if ESPN were to make a 30 for 30 again about some story in baseball, what do you think would make for a great 30 for 30? I mean, there's so many great examples. They've already done one on the 2004 ALCS, Steve Bartman uh, uh, story. What do you think would say you, what's one topic you think would make for a great 30 for 30 potentially baseball related? Yeah, I actually watched a uh, part of the Steve Barton one. It was on the other night. And then the, the 2004 ALCS, the four days in October. That's a great one. I like that one. Um, I think the, the 2016 Cubs would be a great story. You know, the longest championship drought in baseball, 108 years. And then they put this team together and they go on to win. 
I think that would be a great story. Um, I mean, a Jackie Robinson documentary, that'd be tough to do because so long ago, not that many people uh, that are still alive from that time. Uh, so that'd be a tough one to do if you wanted to, you know, get firsthand stories from that time. Uh, maybe, you know, the, the 1961 home run chase with Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle. That's a great story. Um, you could do Cal Ripken. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there are documentaries about yeah. all of these stories, but a 30 for 30 would be great about any of them because uh, ESPN does do a good job usually with the 30 for 30s. So Cal Ripken one would probably be really interesting. One story that I think doesn't get enough uh, recognition or credit is Oral Hershiser's scoreless inning streak in 1988. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it was 59 and a third innings that he didn't allow a single run. And that's the major league record. And I don't think that gets enough recognition. So that's one that I think would definitely be a good story. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I was going to say Cal Ripken. I think that was, that's the most uh, realistic one in terms of you, you can interview Cal. I think you can tie it back to Lou Gehrig give uh, the younger viewers some perspective on him. Uh, and then the 2016 World Series, you know, you mentioned the Cubs, but the Indians, you've got um, a team that hadn't won the World Series since 1948. You've got Terry Francona and Theo Epstein, the two guys that helped orchestrate the 04 Red Sox, breaking the curse of the Bambino. So I think down the road, uh, 25, 30 years from now, that's I will be shocked if they don't do that. That's picture perfect for a uh, 30 for 30 documentary script. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, will be interesting to see what they do with that. I want to to transition now to close out the uh, broadcast with some sort of uh, rapid fire in terms of baseball uh, questions. Right. Now they don't have to be like one word answers. You can elaborate, but kind of to get us in the mindset of, uh, of those type of questions. So the first question I'll start off with is what's more impressive 20 strikeouts or a perfect game. Ooh, perfect game. Yeah. I got to go with the perfect game. I mean, to, to get every single batter out, yeah, I'm sure. I think, though, 20 strikeouts has happened less than a perfect game. Yeah, it's game, happened though. like six times, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, that is that is really impressive. But now, if there was a perfect game where every out was a strikeout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess my, my thinking is I would go with the 20 strikeouts just because I think with a perfect game, there's always that element of luck. You know, usually, I mean, you, you know, like these no-hitters perfect games, there's always that one defining play that, oh, yeah. this guy made the catch preserved the uh the uh, no hitter or the perfect game whereas with the 20 strikeouts it's that's more on the pitcher so it's not as much luck yeah i guess that's to... a good point the the perfect game is more of a team effort even though the pitcher does get the recognition and the 20 strikeouts that's all the pitcher so that, that's a good point yeah uh what is the most impressive baseball record and i guess you can uh pair impressive with probably the one that's never going to be broken i mean you've got Cal Ripken's uh, 26, 32 games in a row. You've got Joe DiMaggio's 56 game hitting streak, Ted Williams, 406, Cy Young, 511 wins. Uh, there's a chance none of those records will ever be broken, but what would you say is the most impressive of those four? Or is there somewhat something else I didn't mention? Uh, I mean, the Joe DiMaggio's hit streak, that's one that definitely comes to mind. And I mean, Oral Hershiser's scoreless inning streak, that's, uh, that's one that I think is definitely – more impressive and underrated but um probably the uh, probably Cal Ripken I mean I don't know if anyone's ever going to come close to breaking his consecutive games streak I mean that's just insane that someone could do that especially in today's game where people get so much rest I don't know that anyone's ever going to do that again I agree with you and I, I also think the 56 game hitting streak is going to be hard to break because you've got I mean when Joe DiMaggio played you had one pitcher usually going nine innings now you've, you're yeah. facing probably on average three to four pitchers a night I mean pitchers don't go complete games anymore um so i that i, I agree with you kyle ripkin but i think uh it's gonna be hard to really any of those records 511 wins i mean greg maddox you know as a braves fan was what second or third all time but he has 358 or something like that so he's not even close yeah. to him um favorite baseball movie favorite baseball movie Ooh. uh well i've got the the 42 poster behind me <laughs> nice. um i do like that one but the sandlot gotta go with the sandlot we do. Uh, that's a great movie. Uh, how about favorite uh, Kevin Costner baseball movie? Because I think he's got he's in a, a league of his own with his own baseball movies. Yeah, what he's got Field of Dreams, Bull Durham, uh, For Love of the Game, at least three. He might have another one or two. I got to go with Field of Dreams. Um, I watched For Love of the Game recently, uh, a couple months ago. I I mean it was all right, but it wasn't one of my favorites. 
And Bull Durham, I think, is more of like a, a romance movie with some baseball in it. It does have its moments, you know, like the the mound visit scene. Um, it, it does have its moments, but I got to go with Field of Dreams just for the nostalgia. And, the, you know, I get, I get chills watching that movie sometimes. It's, it's a good movie. Good story. Yeah. Uh, for, for Love of the Game, I think it's more of a, like a sappy love story with baseball in it more so than it is about baseball. I like Pride of the Yankees with uh, uh, Lou Gehrig. Um, Okay, I haven't with, seen that one. Okay, yeah, I highly recommend it. It's uh, Babe Ruth plays himself. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a story about Lou Gehrig. Uh, I think it's it's interesting because it's not necessarily just baseball. It's more about his life because obviously he passed away from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Yeah. Um, but I, I definitely think it does a good job of weaving sort of that element with the sports element. So uh, highly recommend that when you have a chance. Um, how many baseball stadiums have you been to? Oh man. <laughs> I might have to think on this one a little bit. I think, I think it's 14, 14 or 15, but uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm about halfway, halfway done with the, the entire MLB. So my dad, a few years ago, got to all 30. He, he wow. needed like three more. So he went to uh, Northern California to go to Oakland and San Francisco and then went to uh, Seattle to round it out. So he's got all 30. I think I'm at it either 14 or 15. And what's the favorite that what's your most favorite you've seen out of all of them? Um, so I went to Yankee stadium, the original Yankee stadium before the year that it was, you know, it's final year in existence. Um, so, you know, it's a classic. I haven't been to Fenway yet. I need to get there. Wrigley, Wrigley park or Wrigley field, obviously a, a classic ballpark. Um, PNC is beautiful. You know, a lot of the newer ballparks, they're going for like the retro look. And PNC does that really well. But I really like Petco Park in San Diego. It's just a beautiful park. San Diego is a beautiful city. Um, they've got good food. It's a, a great place to watch a game. So I, I'd probably have to go with Petco Park. Uh, I'm nowhere close to you. I've only been to about five. But I'm, I'm making my way around the, uh, the, uh, the league. I would say it's not that far from us. But Camden Yards, I mean, it's hard to beat the setup of that field. I mean, really the first one of its kind to sort of structure a field like that. Yeah. I mean, and so Camden is the, you know, it's the first one that really started this whole retro design uh, trend in baseball stadiums. So you have to give a lot of respect to, to Oriole park. And I mean, it is a beautiful place too. Yeah. It's unfortunate the team isn't uh, that good, but uh, <laughs> definitely they've got one of the best top five. It's gotta be in terms of uh, 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 baseball. How about, uh, my final question for you, it's, it's kind of a, a hot take sort of question. Might put you on the spot. Give right. me one greatest pitcher of all time. I guess we'll go starting pitcher to kind of save you some, some, uh, some pitchers right there. It's greatest starting pitcher of all time and the greatest hitter of all time. Hmm. Greatest starting pitcher of all time. All right, the first one that comes to mind is Nolan Ryan. Um, but I also really think that Sandy Koufax was one of the greats. But I'm going to have to go with Nolan Ryan. I thought you might go with uh, Greg Maddox, considering you're a Braves fan. Yeah, I mean Greg Maddox was great too. Um, you know, I wish I was, I wish I was around to watch those '90s Braves teams, because uh, I just hear about them. But uh, Nolan Ryan, with the the career strikeouts record and his longevity, I mean, he played like 25 years, so you got to go with Nolan Ryan uh, for best hitter. That's a tough one because, like, overall hitter or pure contact hitter. If you're going with contact hitter, it'd probably have to be Tony Gwynn. Uh, overall hitter, probably Ted Williams. I agree with you. It's hard to beat Ted Williams. And uh, starting pitcher, um, yeah, that's kind of tough. One. Well, how about this? How about the ones you've seen, best hitter you've seen, and best pitcher you've seen? Uh, so I've gotten a chance to see some pretty good players. I've seen Albert Pujols. Uh, I've seen Mike Trout. Um, I've seen Max Scherzer pitch. I've seen Steven Strasburg pitch. Uh, so the best ones that I've seen in person, probably Scherzer for pitching. Um, I, I was uh, lucky enough to go to the All-Star game when it was in D.C. So Scherzer started that. So I saw him pitch in the All-Star game. And I saw Mike Trout hit a home run in the All-Star game. So that was pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, Mike Trout's probably the best hitter that I've seen in person. I agree with you. I mean, I'm a Nats fan, so I have to go with Scherzer. But uh, taking that out of the equation, I mean, it's hard to, hard to beat what he's done his career matt thank you so much for joining us i mean uh, like i said uh you know your baseball so uh when you when you talk baseball i definitely uh, value what you have to say your opinion uh is definitely one that should be heard and you know we had a chance to discuss a lot of things and i think 
primarily we're both happy to see baseball coming back. Won't be normal, but uh, considering these times, we'll take it over nothing. So uh, great for baseball being back, and thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely happy that baseball is back, and I'm glad that, glad that we could do this. Thanks for having me on. Uh, thank you so much. So for my guest, Matt Atkins, again, a producer for MLB Network Radio. I'm your host, Billy Parvatam. Thank you again for joining us, folks, and we'll see you next time.